Hello, everyone. I'm Carly Friedman, the Director of Research for CQL, the Council on Quality and Leadership. Angela Rapp Kennedy, CQL's VP of Systems Transformation, will also be presenting with me today. This webinar will focus on ongoing staff development. I'll first be presenting a study we've completed about the impact of ongoing staff development on the health, safety, and quality of life of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or IDD. Then Angela will be presenting about strategies organizations can use to implement ongoing staff development. This webinar is being recording, recorded, and the recording will be posted on our website and sent out to all people who registered in about a week. We will be taking questions at the end of the session as time permits. In case by chance you're not familiar with CQL, we're an international nonprofit dedicated to the definition, measurement, improvement of, of personal quality of life. Our vision is a world of dignity, opportunity, and community for all people, and CQL is dedicated to the definition, measurement, and improvement of personal quality of life. Here at CQL, we believe in data-informed decisions. Data can be used to inform our knowledge and then to change behavior. This webinar exemplifies exactly that. Since we have people attending the webinar with various backgrounds and experiences, I just wanted to start with a little background before we dive in. So there are millions of direct support professionals, or DSPs, in the United States, more than one million of which support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or IDD. The direct support workforce is one of the fastest growing sectors of the labor force, yet they're still some of the most vulnerable workers in the country. As I'm sure many of you on the call are painfully aware, human service organizations typically see between 30 to 70 percent turnover in DSPs annually. DSP turnover is often referred to as the workforce crisis, despite having existed for decades. Not because it's a new issue, but because in addition to its negative impact on DSPs themselves, it directly puts in peril the community integration and quality of life of people with disabilities. DSP turnover and the crisis it's cre it creates is a decade-long issue. The origins of the crisis date back to deinstitutionalization and community living movements of the 1970s, where smaller ratios were needed in the community and therefore a larger workforce. The roles of DSPs also shifted from caretakers of basic needs, such as health and safety, to continuing to partake in these roles while also supporting people's goals, relationships, and community integration. At the same time, as there's more geographic dispersion than in institutions, community settings also led to less direct supervision and mentorship and more isolation for DSPs. There are a number of factors which contribute to the DSP workforce crisis, one of the most prominent being DSP wages. Despite an increased need for community-based DSPs and an increased workload for DSPs, wages for DSPs have extre remained extremely low, often lower than institutional wages. DSP wages are sig rarely significantly higher than the federal minimum wage. Low wages, combined with a lack of benefits, often causes DSPs to rely on public assistance. Low wages are also one of the top reasons for the high turnover rate and recruitment problems. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, acknowledges DSP wages paid to individual workers are often slow to be adjusted in response to inflation and economic growth and can lag behind wage increases in other health and service sectors. So low reimbursement rates often leave disability organizations competing with the fast food industry because of similar wages. In fact, wages in the fast food industry have been increasing at a quicker rate than wages for DSPs. In addition to low wages, a lack of training also contributes to the workforce crisis. Research suggests DSPs provide the most support typically have the fewest qualifications. While states may have their own standards, few states provide training guidelines, so there's little consistency, and training is often left to providers to figure out. While DSPs are not prepared enough, when DSPs are not prepared enough, people with disabilities suffer. Not only is health and safety a concern, but so is the community integration of people with disabilities, as it's one of the top reasons they are kept at home is because of fear that something might happen because staff do not have enough training to be prepared to prevent those risks. So not only are DSPs the backbone of long-term services and supports, or LTSS, for people with IDD in the United States, 
A competent and stable workforce is also a quality indicator in the lives of people with IDD. For this reason, the aim of the study I'll be describing today was to explore how ongoing staff development impacts the health and safety of people with IDD. Despite health disparities, such as increased likelihood to experience abuse and neglect, less is known about the role ongoing staff development can play in causing or circumventing emergency room utilization, abuse and neglect, and injuries. For this reason, the aim of this research I'll be discussing was to examine the impact staff development has on quality outcomes, particularly the health and safety of people with IDD. We were interested in exploring how ongoing staff development impacts abuse and neglect, injuries, and emergency room visits of people with IDD. To do so, we analyzed data from 73, sorry, 74 human service organizations, which supported approximately 8,300 people with IDD particularly examining the relationship between ongoing staff development from the basic assurances, which is an organizational assessment for human service providers, and health and safety data regarding abuse, neglect, emergency room visits, and injuries. To complete this data analysis, we use the basic assurances. For those who are not aware, the basic assurances is an organizational assessment that ensures health, human, the safety and human security of human service organizations. They are non-negotiable requirements for service and support providers. The basic assurances assessment contains 10 factors, rights protection and promotion, dignity and respect, natural support networks, protection from abuse, neglect, mistreatment, and exploitation, best possible health, safe environments, staff resources and supports, positive services and supports, continuity and personal security, and 10 basic assurances systems. Underneath all 10 of these factors are 46 different subtopics, which are called indicators. Determine if factors and indicators which in, within each of the 10 basic assurances factors are present. Expert reviewers collect a number of data points from multiple sources, including focus groups with people with IDD and DSPs, interviews with organizational leadership and, and people with IDD, data and record reviews, reviews of organizational policies and regulations, and observations of a variety of the agency settings. All of these data are then utilized to complete decision trees to determine if the indicators are present or not. Factor seven in the basic assurances, which is staff resources and supports, explores how agency staff are trained and treated. More specifically, there's a section which examines if and how the organization implements ongoing staff development program, which is what we used in our study to examine the impact of ongoing staff development. For the organization implements an ongoing staff development program practices to be considered in place, the basic assurances examines the following. Does the organization orient new employees to its philosophy, vision, mission, beliefs, goals, organization, programs, and practices? Does the initial orientation and future training for employment advancement ensure effective, efficient, and competent job performance? Are opportunities available for continuing education and best practices within and outside of the organization? Does the organization implement an ongoing in-service training program to maintain, update, and improve staff competency? Is the staff training program developed based on input from support staff, input from people supported, and the results of internal and external findings? And is the training based on adult learning theory? Does it include mentoring on the job support and personal development planning? So utilizing all the data collected and these questions, the expert review team determines if the organization implements an ongoing staff development program, practices are considered to be in place or not. So for the research I'm gonna describe, the data came from one state. It included 74 agencies that supported approximately 8,300 people with IDD. These organizations provided all different types of services, such as res residential, day employment, therapies, recreation, et cetera. In terms of geographic location, approximately 24% of agencies were located in both, sorry, were located in urban settings, 23% were located in rural settings, and 53% were located in both urban and rural settings. In terms of the size of the agencies in the sample, 42% were small, supporting between 1 and 50 people. 
54% were medium size, supporting between 51 and 400 people, and 4% were large, supporting more than 400 people. Here are the health and safety outcomes we examined in the study. Emergency room visits was comprised of every single time a person in the sample visited an emergency room, regardless of the type of incident or severity. Incidents of abuse and neglect included every single allegation of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and mistreatment, both physically and emotional, regardless of whether they were substantiated or not. Injuries included every single time a person was injured, regardless of the severity of the injury. For each of these outcomes, we controlled for agency size to make sure we were comparing apples to apples. So as a result, I'll be talking about outcomes per person supported. For example, the emergency room visit rate was the number of emergency room visits per person supported per year on average. So what did we learn from our analyses? First, agencies in our sample had an average of 0.75 emergency room visits per person supported per year. So for example, an agency that supports 100 people would have approximately 75 emergency room visits in a one year period on average. Now this figure shows the impact of ongoing staff development which had on the number of emergency room visits in one year. So agencies that had ongoing staff development had 0.68 emergency room visits per person per year, whereas agencies without ongoing staff development had 1.13 emergency room visits per person supported. Now these might seem like quite small numbers, but remember, this is per person supported. So for example, if these two agencies each supported 200 people, the one without ongoing staff development is expected to have 226 visits to the emergency room in one year, whereas the one with ongoing staff development is expected to only have 136 emergency room visits. Agencies in our sample had an average of 0.19 allegations of abuse and neglect per person supported per year. For example, an agency that supports 100 people would have 19 allegations of abuse and neglect on average. Now let's look at the impact of ongoing staff development on an instance of abuse and neglect. Agencies without ongoing staff development had 0.42 incidents of abuse and neglect per person supported in a year, whereas agencies with ongoing staff development had 0.16 incidents of abuse and neglect per person per year. So for example, we use that the two agencies that supported 200 people again. The one without ongoing staff development is expected to have 84 incidents of abuse and neglect in one year, whereas the one with ongoing staff development is expected to have 32 incidents of abuse and neglect. For incidents of abuse and neglect, we also found that interactions between ongoing staff development and agency size and geographic location. So the areas in blue are where there were significant differences, particularly of small agencies located in both urban and rural settings, those which had ongoing staff development had significantly fewer instances of abuse and neglect, 0.10 per person supported, than those small agencies in urban and rural areas without ongoing staff development, which was 0.68. So if those two agencies both supported 200 people, that would be 136 incidents per year for agencies without ongoing staff development and that drops to 20 incidents per year for agencies with ongoing staff development. In addition, medium-sized agencies located in urban areas, which had ongoing staff development, also had significantly fewer instances of abuse and neglect at 0.22 per person supported than those medium agencies in urban areas without ongoing staff development, which is 0.66 per person supported. So if those two agencies supported 200 people, that would be 132 incidents per year for agencies without ongoing staff development and 44 incidents per year for agencies with ongoing staff development. Agencies in our sample had an average of 0.35 injuries per person supported per year. For example, an agency that supports 100 people had 35 injuries in a one year per period on average. Looking at the impact of ongoing staff development on injuries, 
Agencies without ongoing staff development had 0.77 injuries per person supported in a year, whereas agencies with ongoing staff development had 0.3 injuries per person supported per year. So for example, those two agencies each supported 200 people. The one that had ongoing staff development would have 60 injuries in a year, whereas the one without ongoing staff development would have 154 injuries in a year. So that's a difference of almost everyone supported experiencing an injury in a year versus only a third of the people supported experiencing an injury. So there was also an interaction between agency size, ongoing staff development injuries, so small agencies with ongoing staff development had significantly fewer injuries than small agencies without ongoing staff development. So those small agencies without ongoing staff development had 0.9 injuries per person supported per year, whereas agency, small agencies with ongoing staff development had 0.32 injuries per person supported per year. So for two agencies that each support 200 people, that's a difference of 100 80 injuries per year versus 64 injuries per year. In addition, medium-sized agencies with ongoing staff development also had significantly fewer injuries than medium agencies without ongoing staff development. So those medium-sized agencies without ongoing staff development had 0.5 injuries per person supported, sorry, 0.58, whereas medium agencies with ongoing staff development had 0.27 injuries per person supported per year. So for two agencies that each supported 200 people, that's a difference of 116 injuries per year versus 54 injuries in a year. Agencies located in both rural and urban areas, which had ongoing staff development, had significantly fewer injuries at 0.3 per person supported than agencies in both urban and rural settings that did not have ongoing staff development, which was 0.6. So the number of injuries is essentially cut in half. In addition, agencies located in urban settings, which had ongoing staff development, had significantly fewer injuries at 0.34 per person supported than agencies without ongoing staff development located in urban settings, which had 1.19 per person supported. So for two agencies that supported 200 people, that would be 238 injuries versus 68 injuries in a year. So data can measure value on a personal level, and the behavior change that results from the data can change lives. Data in the aggregate can measure value on the organizational level and change organizations, which can also change lives. So DSPs and the services and supports they provide directly impact the rights, community integration, and choices of the people with IDD they support. Our findings reveal that by simply offering ongoing staff development, agencies can potentially radically improve their service provision, and by extension, the health, safety, and human security of the people with IDD they support. Ongoing staff development was associated with a 61% reduction in abuse, neglect, mistreatment, and exploitation, a 62% reduction in injuries, and a 40% reduction in emergency visits. So along with changing lives in organizations, data can also transform systems. So this is Angela. Um, I'm glad that you're joining us today. I'm glad to be able to spend some time with you. Uh, obviously, given the data that Carly's been able to show us, it leads us to want to know more, I hope, about how we can do um, even a better job at the area of staff development. Obviously, you're all doing that to some degree, and um, I'm hoping that uh, most of the things that I have to say today are just a refresher for you. Um, if, and hopefully, uh, if not a waste of your time, you'll find some tidbits that you'll, you'll want to take from this. So for us, it's important to start with the orientation. And I also wanna point out that we're talking about staff development. That goes far beyond staff training, as we'll talk about uh, in the next few minutes. So the first step is that orientation, which really starts the minute that you hire someone, and it lasts until the minute they leave your employment. And of course, your goal is to keep them in your employment and to keep increasing their skills and the quality of services that they're able to provide and the quality of life for them and for your organization as a whole. 
So one of the things that's really critical starting out is that orientation to your philosophy, to your vision, to your mission, what you are really all about as an organization. And I'm sure you all feel like you do that now, and I'm sure you do. Um, what I would want you to think about is how you do that. Is it simply a few slides on your introduction? Is it um, a piece of paper that people read every year and sign off on? What are you really doing to embed that mission and vision in your everyday life as an organization? I really encourage you, while obviously you need to have some sentences and words to convey your mission and vision, that you find a way to embody that in a shorter uh, catchphrase, a shorter something that people can really internalize and that really becomes a part of who you are as an organization. Most often when I go to an organization and ask folks about their mission and vision, they can't really tell me what it is. And I don't fault them for that. Usually it's a pretty long um, piece of verbiage. So the more you can find a way to express what that is in an easy way to grasp and then use that throughout your organization all the time so people really embrace what that is, will really make a difference. And um, in terms of your orientation, is your executive director coming to that? Your upper management folks, are they really, are the new uh, DSPs, frontline supervisors coming into your organizations really seeing and hearing from the very top of your organization about that passion, about that mission and vision? Are the people that you support a part of your orientation to new employees? Are other DSPs who who are currently working for you, are they part of your orientation? Those would all be excellent things uh, to think about if they're not already in place for you. So then thinking about curriculum, obviously you wanna have that based on best practice, adult learning theory, uh, a variety of uh, learning modalities, you know, written, audio, visual, hands-on, uh, all those sorts of things, adult learners, do much better if what they're learning is meaningful and somehow connected to what it is they're actually doing. And the other thing about adults is most adults, now you have some who are coming in as young adults who don't have a lot of life experience, but most adults have gifts and talents and experience and they want that to be acknowledged in training. So the more that you can draw out from them to uh, participate and uh, add to what they know, the more relevant it will be, the more that they'll really um, internalize that. Making sure that it's meaningful and accessible. Oftentimes there's required trainings and some of those are those annual trainings that cease to be very meaningful. And so how to uh, be creative and look at making that um, something real for people. And something that you always have are real life examples of things going on in your organizations and that's really useful. Being accessible means accessible in terms of can people really uh, see is it in um, graphically and audio is that working for them uh, is the technology working for them do they know how to use the technology those kinds of things and then of course you know CQL loves and uh, values data and so is your curriculum really looking at that national and organizational data you obviously, I assume, are covering training related to health and safety, preventing injuries, preventing abuse and neglect. The other areas are just as important related to quality of life, respecting and recognizing people's rights, those natural supports, promoting dignity and respect. And so, uh, for example, in terms of data, we found that when support staff are trained specifically to promote dignity and respect and to recognize each person as a unique individual, the number of challenging people behaviors, or challenging in quotation marks, I don't really like that word, um, exhibit is 61% lower when support staff are trained. 
that's significant. And what that means is that people are trained to promote dignity and respect. They're going to be better at effectively uh, looking at people's unique choices and values, understanding that there's more to what's going on than perhaps what they see, all sorts of things that are going to make a big impact for folks. So that curriculum needs to be competency-based. You know, we've all sat through lots of trainings and this especially happens with those trainings that need to re be repeated or trainings that people tend to have had many times over their lifetimes, that it's easy to just sort of be there and hear that information and it has no impact on you at all. So figuring out how to build in some competency assessment, if you will, uh, you can use scenarios, you can use case studies, you can use on the job, looking after training has occurred to be able to, to do uh, looking at how people interact and did that in fact change their behavior, the training. Making sure that you've got a whole host of ways that you're providing training. And when I talk today, and especially in, in the world that we now live in with COVID-19, there's when I talk, there's online training and there's virtual training. And to me, those are two very different things. Online training would be those sorts of things that we rely on a lot. Uh, Relias, Open Futures Learning, Direct Course, which are all important components to your staff development program. Those are what I would consider online. Virtual would be where someone is actually hosting, such as a webinar or a Zoom meeting, and it's interactive and more more of a presentation. It's it's more of the closer to the in-person sort of thing. So when I talk about that, I talk about that as virtual. Obviously, in-person training has uh, plays a key role, which we are now learning to live without in many cases, um, and learning actually some pretty exciting things. We've we've. Uh, had fun learning what we can do with the virtual training and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. One of the things that I think you have to be careful about with online training, um, those of you of a certain age will remember a company called Ronco and their spokesperson was Ron Popeil and he did TV infomercials and it was always for gadgets and kitchen things and uh, they had a rotisserie oven and their tagline was you could stick your chicken in there and set it and forget it. And that's what I think of sometimes that we have to be careful not to default to that when we rely on the online training that we don't just set it and forget it that there's those number of hours staff know what they are they have to log in they do it and and you really don't think twice about it so you really need to be thinking about that competency and tying it back into real life and on the job sorts of pieces the other thing with the online training uh, interestingly I, visiting with staff when i'm out at organizations was very frustrating to many people because they're expected to do the online training, but there may not be the resources available to them. So there may not be enough computers. They may not have time in their schedule to access the computers. So to really think through all of those pieces with those different types. And some people simply didn't know the, how to manage the technology. And so not making those assumptions, but really ensuring that you've supported people in all the ways that you can. That training really needs to be developed for all levels of the organization. We talk a lot about DSPs and of course that is the critical mass of folks, but one of the groups of folks that we're really seeing as those frontline supervisors and those of you in organizations know that's such a critical position and oftentimes what happens is we see DSPs who are marvelous get promoted into supervision and they really have no training or understanding of those issues related to supervision. So making sure that you're targeting training for all levels and not forgetting that upper management that level as well. So some things to, to use in your curriculum, there's something called learning journeys and the way that that 
really is used in some cases is you might send your staff to other organizations that do things well and have them observe how they're doing that and they can learn um, from them and bring that back. Another way I like to think of learning journeys is that we have an incredible skill set in helping the folks we support with person-centered planning we need to use that same skill set with our DSPs to help them look at their gifts and at their talents and how to support them to create paths and maps and other um, uh, options to think about what their desired outcomes are in life. This goes back to the staff development part. It's more than simply training. And then obviously building in evaluation that people, the folks are, that are, are getting the training you're providing uh, have a voice about how you're doing. And relying simply on the piece of paper at the end of training where you, you know, check some smiley faces or a one through five, the, you know, those have their place, but you need to go beyond that. And some uh, research years ago that I had seen was what really, if you really wanted to evaluate your training, you needed to do it like three months down the road, six months down the road. Did what you trained have an impact on the behavior of the folks you trained when they were actually on the job? So that's sort of an interesting thing to think about. The other thing that's really critical from my perspective is if you're going to ask people to tell you how you're doing with your training, you need to do something with that information. So if you ask them and they tell you that it's not good or something's great and they want more of it and they don't see any changes as a result of what they provided to you, they're not going to keep providing you information. We, you know, I talk about that a lot when we talk about data collection. If you're collecting data, if you're asking people for things and you do nothing with it, that's a, an ultimate sign of disrespect of their time and energy. So make sure if you're asking them, you have an intention to change things for the better based on what they've told you. And make sure to continue as we try to always embrace that appreciative inquiry, do more of what's working and stop doing what isn't, even if it's been what you've always done or if it's the system that you've got in place. If it isn't working, take a step back and really look and think about what you could do to make a, a change that would work. So then we want to talk about how you're going to decide what it is you're training. Obviously, you've got requirements from the state and in some of the states, you actually get the curriculum provided to you about what you're going to do. What's really critical is asking the staff that you're wanting to develop and you're wanting to, to keep with you, ask them what types of training and development would be beneficial to them. What would make it easier and better for them in terms of their doing their job? Ask them about the best way to provide that training. Do they like the online training? Do they like virtual? Do they like a mixture? Do they like in person? Um, when do you schedule that? Um, as you guys are all painfully aware, scheduling training is very difficult with different shifts. Um, that's one of the things I see as a silver lining with COVID and the, the need to do more virtual training. Virtual training gives you some more flexibility with that. So if I'm a trainer and I'm doing this virtually, I can flex time and I can be at home in my pajamas at 10 o'clock at night providing training to folks for whom that's their shift. Wouldn't that be a novel concept instead of all of us have been in those trainings where we have the folks who just got off the night shift and they haven't been home and they're coming straight in to do a tra day of training. You know, how valuable is that for anyone? Um, so that's actually one of my little silver, um, I'm the bane of my family's existence because I'm one of those, you know, glass half full people. And, and not everyone in my family is. So that, that's my glass half full tidbit for the day. Um, so really thinking about how are you gathering the information from staff about what you're actually including in your training and then act upon the answers that they give you. And then the next group of folks that you really need to be asking and talking to are the folks you support. 
Um, you should be designing staff training based on feedback that you get from them. You need to ask them what they think staff should be learning, what they think staff need to know. They, their support needs should really be shaping your training and development. And that's why training and development programs probably should look different from organization to organization or within your organization from program to program based on the types of needs of the individuals that you're supporting. And I can guarantee you that the people that are being supported have been training staff much longer than any of us. They have been training those staff of that 70% turnover um, and they have, I, I can't uh, recall the number of times I've had staff or uh, folks supported say to me, you know, I'm so tired of training these new staff that keep coming in. So use that insight and expertise. What is it they're always having to tell people? What is it they're sharing? What's important? Um, and then begin to use them in the training. Use them to help guide your curriculum and help have them be a part of that training team. I'm guessing many of you, I know when I've been out visiting organizations, you're doing a nice job of including folks you support in that orientation piece of your training, that onboarding, which is great. I think that you need to move beyond that and expand them uh, being involved in all of your training topics, not just that orientation and helping people be involved in a meaningful way, not as a, a token. And there are folks for whom, you know, standing up and speaking in front of a group of people is never going to be what they want to do. But maybe they uh, create a PowerPoint that's shared as part of training. There's other ways for them. Or maybe they're sitting in another room at a computer doing virtual training just like this. They're happy to do that. Um, but to really do everything you can to include them as part of the training team and having them share their stories. And not just their stories in a way that's you know, kind of their history or um, what they're doing, but really helping them pinpoint sharing when staff did something that didn't work and the and what the ramifications of that were for them. And then this, the times when staff, what they did that really did work and the impact that had on their life. That is what really sticks with staff who are receiving the training when they hear that from the people that, that are being supported. We want to really make sure that staff development is truly ongoing. It's beyond that initial and the yearly have to's. Um, obviously, you're going to always have those pieces and those are important pieces. It's just that we need to continue everything we can to move beyond those. And also, as we talked about a little bit earlier, making sure those have to's become more meaningful, um, trying to add in different pieces to them to not just be that rote sort of learning. That we need to build in opportunities for folks to maintain skills and update, improve, um, all those things we all want to do. To think about continuing education beyond perhaps what you're able uh, to provide at the organization itself. So what are some best practices in helping people expand their skill sets? Um, do you have an ability within your organization at any level to help pay a little bit for college credits or to allow some paid time off to take classes or to be doing your class work? Some of you I know um, from spending time with you have formed great partnerships with the local colleges and figured out a way that made that a mutually beneficial uh, program that allowed and enabled many more of your staff to get that sort of um, extended education. And some of you are, are blessed to have states that have a way to help with that as well. Perhaps thinking about forming co-ops uh, among the providers in your area who maybe you each have a different sort of expertise that you might be able to lend. So maybe another organization can send some staff for training at your organization and vice versa for different um, particular areas of expertise and topics. Really kind of pushing beyond, pushing the envelope in terms of what kind of 
training and staff development we might do. So creating learning groups. Those might be small groups of folks who have expressed an interest in a particular topic and one or two staff uh, volunteer to do the research and they go out and learn about it and then they come back and share with that group that can be fairly formal can be fairly informal and that is a huge um, uh, positive sort of activity for you as an organization because any of you who have taught know that you learn so much as the teacher so if you've got staff who are going out and researching and coming back and teaching you are not only having that information shared with the group you're developing that staff who did that and that will be a great asset to you um, down the road Training and staff development can be quick things, can be uh, uh, five minutes at the beginning of every staff meeting, five minutes at the beginning of house meetings. You might do quick little YouTube videos. So it doesn't have to be, you know, hour long sessions, day long sessions. It can be short sorts of things. Um, lunch and learn is a good example. Uh, I sort of laughed and wrote in quotation marks for myself, small bites. <laughs> so uh, again, you get together, uh, maybe you provide food, which is always well received, as you all know, and have a, a more informal conversational sort of learning. You might be able to uh, use uh, virtual as we've launched more and more out of need during COVID into virtual. There's there's some fun things you can do. The polls, um, learning how to use the annotate function and people can draw on their screen. And so, so those are all kind of fun sorts of things. Another one is side-by-side -side training, I call it, um, so that you're actually doing training that is targeted for both staff and the people you support. They're going through that training together that is so valuable in so many areas, huge in terms of respect and dignity and rights, learning those things. As you have learned, especially as you have young staff coming in, many of the staff that you have don't even totally understand what all of our human and, and uh, civil rights are. So doing that training together and then really more hands-on training. When we have young folks who are coming in as staff who don't have much life experience and we're expecting them to be providing support and training to the people in our service system. So we're expecting them to teach people how to clean the bathroom or how to do laundry or how to cook meals and prepare grocery lists and they perhaps have never done that in their own life. <laughs> so that kind of training training could be done together and it really creates a camaraderie and a different a different context between the the staff and the folks you support i know one organization struggled they you know they would have overnight staff be responsible for some cleaning and so then the, they'd come in and they check and they say you what did you do last night you didn't clean the bathroom and the staff would say well yes i cleaned the bathroom and they quickly learned that their definition of what cleaning the bathroom was was very different so they actually created some short little videos using their upper management in the videos and made them pretty humorous but about how to clean the bathroom and use those for training and so that was i thought just a novel way to do that and again those are things that can be done together with the direct support staff as well as the people that we support and some of that's just a good example of the more that we can do to make learning relevant and interesting and fun the more people are going to actually retain the information and those will become competencies for them and they're also going to have a different sense of your view of them and you know capture people's attention and do some unexpected things so that they're looking forward when it's time for training rather than seeing it as a sort of another drudgery mentoring i think we all know that that's been shown to be very useful and to increase staff retention in many cases it's a way you know people want to be noticed and feel like uh, they're valued for what they know and so choosing those people who can be mentors and what that does for staff development is very powerful and then the staff 
people want to feel like they know what they're doing. And that's feedback we hear from staff often is I, I feel like I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know how to do it. And so that mentoring really helps with that role as well. Personal development planning, again, sort of back to that helping people have that um, person-centered planning aspect as a staff person. And then self-care is a huge part and not to be overlooked in your staff development. So, um, you know, reducing stra stress and burnout, uh, again, those are skills that are important for everybody to know and can be those kind of skills that are taught both for staff and for the folks you support. I think more and more it's becoming so clear that DSPs have experienced historic in their history and are currently experiencing trauma. Uh, we talk a lot now about trauma-informed care for the folks that we provide services to, and it's becoming clear that that's a huge conversation and area of need for the direct support staff. And many of the direct support staff, you all know this, they're struggling, you know, they're, they're uh, at poverty level, they're working multiple jobs, there are lots of issues. And we also know that historically it's been shown that people who come out of uh, challenging backgrounds as children often are, go to, go on to become employed and choose the helping professions, we would call them. Um, and so you perhaps perhaps have uh, staff that have a lot of baggage. And so helping people learn self-care is in everyone's best interest, in their best interest and in your best interest as an organization, and certainly in the best interest of the folks that are supported. And, and really thinking about self-care in two ways that you can uh, create those training and that development to, for folks to be preventative, to, to, you know, keep from being overstressed, to keep from burning out, but also restorative for those folks who've already experienced that. And then promoting ongoing staff development um, we're hoping, you know, we're, we're looking toward that increased training can lead to increased wages and professionalization of the workforce. We're hoping as a industry that the more that we can do that, that we're going to, you know, see some movement towards wage stabilization, see DSPs continuing to stay on at organizations. And when you're thinking about staff development, thinking about how to help DSPs who are good at being, D, being DSPs, who love to be a DSP, helping them figure out how to continue within your organization to grow both um, skill-wise as well as wage-wise and continue to be a DSP. Uh, not everyone is cut out to be a supervisor. And right now in many, uh, most organizations, that's sort of the next step, a, a way of uh, your professional growth. So trying to think of, of different avenues and journeys that you can develop for DSPs who really flourish and do so well in that role. And everything that you're doing through staff development is really reinforcing the sense of your employees that they're valued. And that clearly is one of the things that keeps people around. Um, these steps um, towards staff development, they improve the lives of DSPs and, of course, most importantly, the people that are supported. I think it's really important as you think about staff development to also think about that we need to treat our staff the way that we would like them to treat the people that they're supporting. So that means that we need to be treating them with dignity and respect. And as you've seen today, the data shows that that's just good business. That um, is in everyone's best interest. So ongoing staff development is an investment not only in the quality of the services and supports that the DSPs are providing at your organization, but it's an investment in the DSPs themselves. And we all know that vast array of skills and tasks that DSPs are required and need to provide every day. And I think we can all do better in terms of the quality, um, making things relevant, helping staff feel valued and that we're interested in their development. And 
clearly the data shows us investing in staff development is a win-win. And we've seen that today in reducing things like abuse, neglect, ER visits and injuries. And it's easy to think about those and look at those as numbers. You know, um, that's great, we reduce the ER visits. But all of you, uh, certainly I can relate to the, those visits that you've made yourself. They're way more than a number. A visit to the ER has so many ripples and ramifications. So it goes far beyond just reducing a number. It's, it's really changing the quality of lives, both for the folks you support and the folks that you employ. So, you know, for me, sort of wrapping up my piece, clearly the data shows that um, when people supported experience supports that are coming out of respect and helping them with their rights, that their total quality of life improves. We see that from the personal outcome measures data very clearly. So helping DSPs to do that, that's what staff development really is all about. So for those of you interested in the full research study we've shared with you today, or similar research articles, I'd like you to point you to I'd like to point you to the research section on our website, c-q-l.org, where we have hundreds of articles and full peer-reviewed journal articles available for you for free. And also we'll be posting that link for this study in particular in the comment box. And some of the findings we shared with you today are actually scheduled to come out next week. For those and all new studies we conduct. We, when they're released, we actually send them out through our research listserv. So if you're interested in signing up for that, that's also on the bottom of our webpage. You can access the summaries as well as the full studies. Our contact information is on the screen if you have any questions or you'd like to follow up with us directly. We'll now take some questions as time permits. We have the question and answer box. If you have any questions, you can type them in there. So our first question is, what is the frequency of ongoing develop staff development? I'm assuming you mean related to the study. And in the sample for the study, 70% of agencies had ongoing staff development and 30% did not. And then the I see there's a question. Oh. Oh. oh, sorry, Carly. I, I was going to say, I see okay. there's a question about what's this, is there a best staff development training? And the answer mm -hmm. is no. <laughs> you, you, it's really a, um, it's sort of, I think about training as a toolkit and you uh, look at the pieces that uh, fit for you and there are, you know, great online trainings, there's great virtual trainings, there's great in-person training and it really, the best staff development want, uh, training is the one that's tailored to the people that you employ and the folks you support and clearly there are lots of options out there to pick and choose and I think many organizations you, you just start with something, start with something to, to add to um, that toolkit that you have. And then I see a question about, uh, I mentioned about evaluations being completed three months after the initial training. Um, and so the question was, is this to quiz the new hire of competency or is it where the new hire gives feedback of how effective they feel the initial training was? And actually, I think you can use it as both. When I was talking about it, I was actually talking more about the how they felt the training was now that they'd actually gone out and used it. But you could also have that list of competencies that was your goal for the training. And you could then be able to not necessarily quiz them, but be able to sit down and talk with them or to observe them and see if they had that set of competencies. So you could really use it um, in both ways. There's a question about, I run an agency that's in-home, uh, like more personal care, it sounds like not comprehensive care. And we, um, it says we do not support individuals with medical, personal or behavioral needs. And we struggle to find relevant, helpful trainings, any resources. I think I always encourage people to go to the CQL website. It's such a wealth of, free resources. I think that if you look there in articles, the Capstone newsletter is an excellent place to, to go to because that um, resource 
always has some best practices from different organizations. The other place I think is a good resource is our e-community. They have been so responsive. If you go on there and you throw out a request, I guarantee you someone's going to give you some good resources. And then an objective evaluation of the training can be used toward career ladders and tied to enhanced wages. Absolutely. Um, um, somebody said, I like the idea of side-by-side -side training. What's a good start? Just pick something. <laughs> um, pick something that feels like it would be easy for you. Um, certainly rights is a great place to start. Uh, maybe using um, the rights cards that we've got. I don't know if you've seen those. Those are a fun way. It's a, you know, more of an informal kind of games feeling. Um, you can use that in a training way. Um, but really just anything that would be useful to both the folks that you employ and the folks that you support. Carly, I think there's a question here for you. Did you determine in your study in what areas DSPs felt unprepared to go out into the community with the people they support? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, that wasn't part of the scope of the study, but I think there's other research about that. There's a question about where we could access a copy of the rights card. Seth has actually posted a link in the comment section about where you can access those. Okay, Joe's back with a follow-up on his question. I didn't really understand. Okay, so he's, he's saying it's not really a question. It was more like tying that the knowledge and how the DSP used that knowledge, um, you can see a direct correlation to the outcomes that people supported achieve. Absolutely. And I think um, that's one of the things that's been very exciting about being able to use the personal outcome measures data and the basic assurances data because we can actually uh, begin to make some of those connections. So I think that's absolutely true. Um, training and staff development takes time. Absolutely. Do you have suggestions for how to encourage leaders to invest this time? They are already overworked. I totally, totally get that. Um, everyone on this call is totally overworked, I guarantee you. I think um, one of the reasons for doing this sort of webinar and one of the things that we value having Dr. Carly Friedman at CQL so highly for is that you've got data. You've got data right here in this webinar that showed if we devote time and resources to staff development, we are going to reduce our visits to the ER. We are going to reduce injuries. We're going to reduce incident reports. That in and of itself usually encourages leaders. To invest the time because it's they see what the outcome is of that in in real um, concrete terms so i think the more that you can use the data in this webinar go to the website carly has posted a plethora of research and that data really is compelling and so i would encourage you to um, you know, maybe, you know, copy one of those or send an email to one of your leadership with some of those on there. Okay, well, we're at time. So I would like to thank you all for attending. As I mentioned, the recording of the webinar will be sent out to you via email as well as posted on our website in about a week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks to all of you.